My name is Caitlin Rose, and I'm with Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP, and we're a partner with SODCAP. Uh, PCAP does a native prairie speaker series around southwest Saskatchewan, and so it's presentations about species at risk, and we try to do um, an in-person one in rural communities. Um, so I would like to thank SODCAP for letting us host a speaker this afternoon as part of the, today's AGM. Um, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Jeff Lane with the University of Saskatchewan, and he'll be talking about bracing for catastrophe, white nose syndrome in the Canadian prairies. Um, so PCAP has, uh, does a number of different native prairie speaker series. We have a few webinars coming up, which you can watch from any location. One is about uh, mammal monitoring in Alberta, and then another one in September about uh, swift fox recovery. And um, you can check out the PCAP website for information about those. And I would just like to note that funding for today's presentation has come from Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as SAS Power. Um, and we'll just save questions for the end of the presentation today, if that's okay. Um, and a little bit about our presenter. So Dr. Jeffrey Lane is an associate professor with the Department of Biology at the University of Saskatchewan. He finished his PhD at the University of Alberta in 2008 and postdoc in Edinburgh, Montpellier, France, and Edmonton before starting at the U of S in 2013. His research interests are in integrated organismal biology, and he currently has students working on hibernation on Columbian brown squirrels, energy acquisition and use in North American red squirrels, and hibernation in black-tailed prairie dogs. The bat work is a new undertaking in their lab and is supported by the Habitat Stewardship Protection Fund, which is with Environment and Climate Change Canada but Jeff himself is familiar with bats as he did work on them during his Master's of Science with Dr. Mark Brigham at the University of Virginia. So with that, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Um, can everybody hear me okay if I don't use this? I tend to like to wander and shout. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Caitlin, for the introduction, and to Caitlin and Tom for the opportunity to come down and talk to you. Thanks also to Tom for letting everybody have a five minute break before I started. <laughs> it's easier to pay attention to a presentation if you've had a pee and a donut. Um, and I do want to keep your attention as I go through this because it's, um, it's a topic that we're facing in Saskatchewan. It's literally knocking on our door. I think it's a highly important one. Um, and so it's one that I've um, kind of recently come to, uh, to, I guess, devote some of my time to. Um, and so you probably noticed when Caitlin introduced me, there was very little talk, and if anything, she oversold my um, qualifications or experience with bats. I did a little bit a long time ago in another lifetime when I was doing grad school. Now I tend to work with um, small things that run on the ground or run in trees. And so, I, I say that reluctantly, because if I was mentoring one of my students, the last thing I would tell them to do is crater your confidence in your audience by telling them you don't really know what you're talking about. I did that reluctantly for two reasons. One was to sort of give you an idea about what this talk will be like. If I was giving a talk on prairie dogs where we work in grasslands, I'd be showing you some data, giving you some findings of what we figured out. That's not really going to be this talk because it's a brand new undertaking for us. And like I say, it's an undertaking that we have undertaken because of this, this pressing need, or as I see it and as others see it. The, the other reason that I, I say that is just because I'm hoping to sort of convince you over the, the sequence of the talk that um, this is something that requires our attention and it's something that's kind of required me to step outside of my comfort zone. And so what do I mean? What am I talking about with this, um, this challenge that we're facing? So basic, actually maybe I'll ask if everybody's still bold, how many people by show of hands have heard of white nose syndrome before? Oh yeah, that's awesome. So we're, it's kind of getting into the news. And this is really, really important because literally, as I'll show you some maps in a few minutes, um, it's really right up at our doorstep. And this is problematic because this is a disease that is causing an unprecedented decline in a wild mammal. So this is, I should say wild mammals, because it's affecting multiple bat species across North America. When I say unprecedented, I mean that both in terms of the geographic scale of the problem or the challenge, as well as the effect that it is having on the species. 
Oh, I also, here again, I, this is a, maybe a little bit of a clue for myself. When I was first asked to give a title for my presentation, I think this is just something that academics do. It's kind of a personality um, quirk. We agonize over the words we use. When I was doing my grad school on bats, it was beaten out of me that I was never allowed to say the word utilize because it's just a $5 word for use. So things like that, we're always wondering, or is this the right term to use? And I really wondered, should I say catastrophe? Is that, is that overselling it? Would collapse be better? Would crisis be better? Would population decline be better? And in the end, I decided, for me at least, that it does meet the, the definition of a catastrophe, both in terms of the, the biological consequences and potentially the economic consequences of this disease. My only regret is I missed the pun, and I should have called it a bad task. <laughs> like I say, so um, at minimum, this is a conservative estimate. This, this catastrophe, this bad catastrophe, will reach Saskatchewan in, in a year or two. And what this means, um, or I should say this decline of these species, is incredibly recent. Everything I'm going to tell you today has basically been figured out in the past decade plus a year or two. It is not preventable. So we can put up a wall, we can build the wall, it doesn't matter, the, wall, the bats are just going to fly away. It is coming to Saskatchewan. It is likely to have fairly major economic consequences. These are relatively unmeasured. I'm going to give you a couple of estimates from other places in North America that have tried to figure out what the economic consequences would be. But for the most part, we know they're probably substantial, but we don't know exactly what they're going to be yet. And it's going to require a coordinated effort. So scientists working with landowners, working with governments, etc. Unfortunately, up until now, south of the border and north of the border, um, there has been a coordinated effort to try and tackle this problem. So what am I talking about? What am I talking about when I'm talking about white nose syndrome? What is the big deal? I think it's kind of helpful, and this is going to emphasize kind of how recent this disease is. So a little over a decade ago, when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was conducting um, hibernaculum counts in New York State, this was something they did regularly. They would go in, count the number of individuals that are in the hibernaculum. Depending on the species, depending on the year, the uh, species tends to be um, fairly faithful to hibernaculum, so they could use these as population counts over time. They noticed huge numbers of mortalities. Basically, they would go into these big caverns. Some are maybe half the size of this room. They were expecting to see little clusters of bats up in the roofs. And what they saw was a floor that was littered with little bat skeletons. So they knew something was wrong. The few individuals that were alive had these ratty wings. They had this white stuff growing on their nose, hence where the name of the disease comes from, on, as well as on their wings and on their ears. <clears throat> so I'm kind of back cast a year two because after they, they made this discovery, um, a, a photo arose that showed a picture of a bat like this one here that had this white stuff growing on its nose in a cave called Howe Cave in New York, a big tourist attraction. So they knew this was going to be a problem. Um, they called a bunch of bat biologists together. Again, I'm not a bat biologist. I wasn't there. This is what I heard from my bat biologist friends. Um, and they recognized quickly that this white nose, this white gunk on their noses and, and um, wings was a type of fungus. At the time they called it Geomyces destructans. They later realized it's another even worse to pronounce the name Pseudogenocastus destructans. They call it PD for short. And interestingly, this, this fungus was previously unknown to science. So it's not like we knew this was sort of sitting in the environment and all of a sudden it this had never been described by science before. And so here, I want to sort of keep an eye on this little thought. So this is where it starts. This is the epicenter of the catastrophe. Lots of bats, one little cave in New York. And here's where this coordinated effort first sort of kind of benefited the situation. The very next year, they called a bunch of bat biologists to upstate New York. 
they got together and tried to figure out what was going on and what are we going to do about it. Because they didn't know exactly what was going on yet, but they knew it was a problem. Widespread declines. And again, speaking with my bat biologist friends, they have stories where they would go into a cave, there'd be 10,000 bats one year, they'd go in the next year, there'd be 1,000, they'd go in the next year, there'd be a couple of dozen, and then they'd go. Huge declines, rapid declines, with little idea what's going on. So in three years later, they confirmed that this fungus was actually the cause of the disease. Now this, this seems relatively straightforward and intuitive in hindsight. You go in, you've got a bunch of bats displaying a symptom, this fuzzy white stuff growing on them. Well, that could be causing it. But there was good reason to suspect that it wasn't the disease, and it was actually just an opportunistic fungus. The same way if you go into um, one of your pastures, you find a mouse on the ground, and it has some um, fungus growing on it, well, it probably died, and the fungus is just colonizing it after. And there were good epidemiologists that said that funguses don't kill otherwise healthy mammals. They can kill plants, they can kill lots of amphibians, but they shouldn't be able to kill mammals. And it was only after they went in and experimentally inoculated bats. So they took some bats from the wild, brought them into the lab, took some of this white stuff off of another bat, and wiped it on to otherwise healthy bats, and then saw what happened, that they realized that that inoculation, that putting the white stuff on the bats, caused them to get white mouse syndrome and die over the hibernation period. So here they confirmed, again, they're using the older term, but it's the same fungus, that it causes white mouse syndrome. In those three years, that it took them to confirm that this fungus caused white nose syndrome, it had spread this much. Remember, here's our first little cave. This is where it was after three years. Again, this is what they're finding when they're going into these high vernacular. Formerly healthy populations of bats, and all they're finding are bodies, skeletons on the ground, They'll often see animals that are alive again will have symptoms of the disease, the white noses, the white wings. Sometimes they're seeing bats flying around in the winter. I didn't make that clear enough up until now. This is happening in hibernacula over the winter. <clears throat> and the suggestion that they're waking up in the winter suggests that something's happening, something's wrong. This isn't a normal behavior of bats. And I'll also use this as a bit of a preface to say that I know this is a Prairie Conservation Action Series, but I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit in Saskatchewan because um, the bats potentially aren't hibernating in the prairies. And you can, can kind of look at the bats as kind of like a frog. It needs, you know, one habitat, an aquatic environment, and part of its life, and a terrestrial environment for part of its life, and it goes through metamorphosis. The bats need hibernaculum to make it through the winter. These are the caves or mine shafts where they hibernate. And they need good summer habitat to survive over the summer and reproduce. And that's where we what we're doing on the prairies. So where is it now? Like I say, this was 2011. If my AV skills work, this is going to bring up an interactive map. It's going to show us kind of how it's marched across the continent since 2008. So here's our little dot in New York. Again, 2006, let's say that's when that picture was taken from the single cavern. Again, we're talking just over a decade this has happened. And now it's starting to spread. This is before they've identified it as a cause of white mouse syndrome. Spreading quickly into Canada now, Quebec, Maritime Provinces, uh, 2012, more and through the Northeast. Every color is a different year. Over here is 2016. This is, was totally surprising and really problematic. It somehow jumped. So all of the models for how quickly this disease is going to spread and reach different places were thrown out the window because they were mapping this spread based on its natural spread each year. And for whatever reason, it jumped cross-continent in 2016. It's spreading at about 200 or 250 kilometers per year. Most recently, I think it shows up here, I'm not really showing it very well. As of March, it was detected in Riding Mountain National Park. It's literally on our list. So I've shown you some gory pictures about what 
this does to these animals, this is what it does to their populations. Again, so this is data from the Northeast United States. Going back to the 1980s, they have really good programs that really go into these hibernacula. It's a great way to count wildlife because they're sitting there, they're zero degrees Celsius, and you can just count them quickly. And you can see that actually up until the point of white nose sitting, indicated here by this gray bar, populations were actually stable or, or were increasing. So things were going relatively well for bats. This is what happens after white nose sits. Total population. So it's estimated at about 80% or more than 80% in the hibernation. They've lost count now, but over the last time that they counted, um, they, they estimated about 6 million bats that have been lost um, over this six year period. So we're six years beyond that now, so use whatever math you want, it, it's a lot less. And they estimate that this will sweep across North America within about 15 to 17 years. And without some sort of intervention or adaptation of the animals, many of North America's bat species could actually go extinct due to this disease. And so, I mean, these, as I say, it's so unprecedented, it's so extreme, that it's talked about in the same sort of conversation that people talk about colony collapse disorder. We don't need to belabor these because I'm sure many people, all of you, have heard of these things before, these loss, uh, widespread losses of um, honeybee colonies across the globe, potentially worth hundreds of billions of dollars because, of course, they pollinate so many things that we need. Chytridomycosis, I also mentioned that there is a fungus that kills frogs and amphibians. That's this chytrid fungus responsible for the extinction of numerous frog species. Um, global amphibian declines. To date, 30% of species have been infected. And then this white mouse syndrome that we're going to talk about. I apologize, my photo credits are showing. So this is so extreme, so rapid, such a precipitous decline that it led the Canadian government to classify three species of uh, bats in Canada as provisionally endangered in 2012, which was then confirmed in 2013. Now I'll go through each of the species throughout the talk, but to just give some idea, the way I kind of think about this, especially with little brown bats, little brown bats if anybody in the room has seen a bat, you know, sitting on your porch, the lights outside, a bat swooping around doing its acrobatic things, it's probably a little brown bat. Widespread across North America, totally abundant. I have, basically, they're kind of like the chickadee, the chickadee of the, the bat. I remember going on, years and years ago, going on a Christmas um, bird count with a bird friend. He saw a chickadee up in, in the trees and he said, Man, if anything ever happens to the chickadees, then we know we're in trouble. Because they're everywhere, right? We've got lots of chickadees, they're widespread. If something was to cause chickadees to decline, then we know we've screwed up. That's what's happening with bats. I should say we've screwed up because it's a multifactorial thing that we're, we're trying to figure out. It is a disease, um, but something is wrong. You know, the canary in the coal mine has died. I mean, something's going on. And so here, these are just the recovery action plans for the three species, uh, proposed in 2015, confirmed in 2018. So to understand why people are getting worked up about this, it maybe helps a little bit just to talk about the biology of that. So I'm going to do that very, very briefly. So there are species that few people have seen, even fewer know that much about, just because they're active at night, they're relatively quiet, at least to our ears, and they're just kind of this thing that's been in the background, and a lot of us haven't spent that much time worrying about. They're actually incredibly diverse, so second only to rodents in terms of the diversity across the planet. Of course, this is going to be centralized in the tropics, where they're going to have hundreds of species. So their order is called the Choroptera, it actually means hand wing, and they're split into the two big groups. So the so-called flying foxes, unfortunately we don't have any of these in Canada, at least wild. Um, they're found in Australia, Africa, Asia. And then the micro or just micro bats. So 
Notice some difference here. They're aptly named. They look like a flying fox or a flying dog. Big eyes, smaller ears, a little bit more active during the day. If you've spent any time in Sydney, you will see these things flying over you and if you've gone up to a cafe. And then our microcrops are tiny little eyes, you can't really see them. Lots of them have these massive ears. This is a spotted bat. This is actually a species that we do have in Canada, although not in Saskatchewan. It just spends its time in the wine country of the Okanagan. They have a range of sizes, so everything from this tiny little bumblebee bat, which is potentially the smallest mammal on the globe, although there's a little shrew that kind of vies for that title as well, up to uh, about a kilogram and a half, which is one of these huge flying foxes. A wingspan basically as wide as I am tall. They have a huge number of roles as well. By far, most of them are insectivorous. So they eat insects of some sort. All of our bats in Canada eat insects. In the tropics, there are pollinators. There are flowers that have evolved to be pollinated by bats. They're white, they open up at night. So they're attracting bats to do their pollination. Tequila, if anybody likes tequila, is pollinated by a bat. There is actually a major catastrophe, whether it's a bat catastrophe or a people catastrophe, is that people were actually shooting the bats that were pollinating the agave plants because they thought that they were eating the fruits. But actually, the bats were pollinating. So tequila catastrophe, which I think has been a birth of that. Some are carnivores, so there are bats that eat birds. There are cool bats that have these um, sort of garden um, rake style feet that they'll skim across the surface of water and get um, fish with. There are bats that eat other bats, there are bats that eat frogs. I didn't mention it here, but especially in the megacroptron, there are fruit eaters, so they're important for seed dispersal. You may have heard this, you know, that one of the myths, I put myths in quotation marks about, you know, all bats are these flying demons that are going to get into your hair and drink your blood. That isn't true, for the most part. There are actually vampire bats. There are three species of vampire bats, only one of which feeds on mammals, and really it's sort of livestock and sort of big ungulates that are found in Central and South America. This is a picture of that individual here. The other two feed on uh, birds. <clears throat> so, in combination with flight, bats are the only mammal that are able of, um, to sustain flight, unlike a, a flying squirrel, for example, which just flies. The other sort of diagnostic feature is this echolocation. They basically use sonar to find uh, either prey or just their way around. Even the mega bats have some rudimentary sonar, highly developed in microcropture, hence these sort of satellite dish ears that they're using. And so I say worldwide, 1,200 species of bat. Most of those are in the tropics. In Canada, we have 18 native bat species, all of which are these micro bats, the insect eaters, the small eyes, the big ears. They're all pretty tiny. Our biggest one is 35 grams. That's this individual here. It's called a hoary bat. That's Canada's largest bat species. It's a somewhat dubious title when you look at the size of it relative to something else. My friends like to, my bat nerd friends like to call these flying sky lions. And like I say, they're all insectivorous, consuming vast quantities of insects in the night sky. At least 15 species are known to hibernate in caves, putting them in danger of white nose. This is where the fungus attaches to the bat. So 15 of our 18 species are known to hibernate in caves. The others, like the hoary bat, are actually migratory, so they're much more like a bird. They'll take off to southern United States or Central America for the winter. They are capable of torpor, dropping their body temperature, actually even hibernation, but they just don't do it in caves up here, as far as we know. They, um, they spend most of their lives in the forests. Really cool lifespan. So unlike, these are kind of the size of like a mouse or a bull or a shrew. All of those species typically would live about a year. They pump out five or six litters with eight or nine babies in each, in each litter. Bats can live 12 to 30 years. They're much more like a grizzly bear in terms of how long they live than a mouse. 
but they have really low reproductive output, again, like, like a grizzly bear. So they'll produce one or two pups, probably because of the, the constraints of flying um, per year. Now this is not only cool as a biologist, but it's also concerning because if you knock out a field of uh, deer mice, for example, as I'm sure many of you know, they're going to be back the next year because they have high reproductive potential. If you knock down a population of bats, it's much more like knocking down a field of grizzly bears, if they're a field of grizzly bears. It's going to take generations, for our generations, for them to come. And most numerous, and I have to put an asterisk by this currently, is the little brown bat. So this is its distribution all over North America, down in New Mexico. This is the distribution of white nose syndrome here. Actually, I think this is a little dated. It's a little bit further over. So currently, and especially in Saskatchewan, where we hope white nose syndrome isn't yet, this is our most numerous bat species. Tonight, after supper, if you go out outside, I'd almost guarantee if you look by the lights outside, you're going to be seeing little brown bats swooping and doing their activities. I'm going to go this, through this really quick, but these are our three listed species. This is the tricolored bat. I'll go through it, this one especially quickly because it actually doesn't get into Saskatchewan, but it's worth chatting about a little bit because you can see as there a species here where most or a good chunk of their distribution is already covered by white nose. So once one of the most numerous bats in North America, now like all the species, they've been taking it on the chin for white nose. Eastern part of the continent, not known to occur in Saskatchewan. Tiny, you know, definitely not one of our, um, you know, well, a fifth the size of our hoary bat, like our, our heavyweight in Canada. For areas in agriculture, <coughs> rarely found in urban areas, unlike some of the other bats. Hibernate deep in caves, putting them in harm's way from white nose. And like many species, they're just easier to study when they're hibernating because they're sitting there and they're not moving. So there's a lot more known about their hibernation than their summer habitat. But a lot more is still very little. Bats aren't very well studied um, as, in terms of all. Our northern myotis, this is a species we get in Saskatchewan, but primarily up in the north, the boreal forest. Um, these so sometimes are called the northern long-eared myotis because they have these long, pointy ears. They also have highly precise echolocation, and that serves them well for swooping through really dense forests. This is potentially a really important predator of forest pests in the forested environments, things like spruce bark. And again, relatively small. Um, and hibernate deep in the case. Here's where I'll spend most of my time. <coughs> Here's our little brown myotis. <coughs> this is the one that we get on the prairies as well as other places. It's more of a generalist in terms of habitat and potentially diet as well. Wide ranging, currently the most abundant, particularly in the western part of its range, resident throughout Saskatchewan urban areas, um, prairie areas, forested areas, etc. They're the best studied, again, that, that's kind of a dubious um, honor because they, they haven't been that well studied relative to other things like hundreds. <clears throat> Relatively similar in size, also a key hibernating species. So what, what exactly is going on with this white nose syndrome? As I mentioned, it's caused by this ED fungus. This is a blown up electron microscopy picture of a bat here to give you some idea of the scale, and this is a fungus that has colonized that I, um, <clears throat> I should say that a lot of the work that's being done has been done by other people, and particularly a good friend of mine, Craig Willis at the University of Winnipeg, who actually gave a native speaker um, talk uh, a few months ago. Um, he described, and actually I was listening to it as I prepared for this talk, he describes a, a sort of a series of attributes or traits of a disease that make it a problem in terms of conservation. So here's one that makes it a problem for bats. It's a weird fungus. It's not like your athlete's feet of fungus because it's full tolerant. It grows really well between 4 and 15 degrees Celsius, and it can't grow past 20 degrees Celsius. These are exactly the conditions that bats love to hibernate. So this is why these bats are getting infected while they're hibernating because they're getting it in the cave and it can't grow beyond 20 
So when they leave the cave, when they warm up for the summer, they can shed the fungus if they survive it. Humans can't get this fungus because it couldn't survive on us at 37 degrees. <clears throat> there are other aspects that put it um, in kind of the danger range for wildlife species. One is that it is called density independent. What that means is it doesn't matter how many of its hosts are around as to how effective it is at transmitting itself. The opposite of that would be something like the common cold, which is density dependent. So I've been fortunate throughout my adult life, at least, to rarely get colds. That was until I had kids, and I started putting them in the daycare and kindergarten. And then, at least every autumn, I'm getting their cold that they got because they're in a high-density environment. There's lots of little snotty noses that are exchanging those colds, and my kids are bringing that home. This, that's not the case with the bats. If you split up all the kids, if they're all homeschooled, transmission rates would go way down. That's not the case with the bats, because this fungus can sit in the cage. It doesn't need to be on a bat. So if all the bats went away, and again, like some, some of these hibernacula, the bats have gone extinct. If we were trying to reintroduce bats into that hibernacula, they would still get the fungus. So the population could go down to zero. They could get the fungus a year or two later. It also is infecting multiple species. So again, this is problematic because it doesn't matter if, the, let's say, the population density of uh, little brown bats is low. They could get it from a northern bat. And they will hibernate in mixed species assemblages with some microclimatic differences. So there are reservoirs in the, in the environment, and there are reservoirs on other bats. Well, the last thing that makes it a problem is we now know that it was most likely introduced to North America likely by recreational cavers. They went and they were exploring caves in Europe, they got some spores on their boots, totally unbeknownst to them, they then went and explored How Cave and deposited those spores in How Cave. And unlike, or not unlike, a lot of introduced or invasive species, this is really hard on our native species because they're what we call naive to the pathogen. So this pathogen, it, it's a free lunch for it, right? Because our, our populations have an evolved resistance to it. Interestingly, they've subsequently isolated, they've never looked for it before, remember nobody